and welcome to another episode of Search Off the Record, a podcast coming to you from the Google Search team discussing all things search and maybe having some fun along the way. My name is John, and I'm joined today by Lizzie from the Search Relations team, of which I'm also part of. As a special guest, we have Josh Cohen, the amazing tech writer from the Search Console team. And that makes it no big surprise that in today's episode, we're going to be talking about the Search Console Help Center. Hi, Josh. Hi, how are you? I'm waving, if uh, hopefully all everybody can, can see that. Can hear it. It's an audible wave. Yes. yes. We will <laughs> describe it for the listeners. He waved semi-enthusiastically. It was a good wave. It was a good wave. Yeah. It was definitely a good wave. Yep. Yeah. 10 out of 10. Cool. So, so Josh, I, I think you've been around for, for quite some time. Can you tell us a little bit about how long you've been at Google and what your path uh, towards tech writing has been? Sure. So I started in uh, 2006, so uh, you can do the math. I worked at a different company before then. And here, um, I've done all sorts of documentation, external and internal. When I first started, the, all of the writers at Google could sit around a table and have lunch together, and we sometimes did. I worked on a bunch of different internal platform documentation for Google engineers. Um, I later on moved to, I did some additional external stuff. Um, I've done API documentation externally. Um, this is the first sort of more end user product uh, that I've worked on. Um, I think I may have even worked on the first, 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 at least with the first, first, first version of Search Console, because Search Console itself, I think, is something like 15 years old or longer. Mm. And it came out of the Seattle office, which is where I started. And later on, another writer started there. And I think they may have been working on Search Console there uh, at the time. Uh, and I was actually working with uh, Vanessa Fox, who was, I think, known to the SEO community, uh, who was, the, was my uh, direct manager, writing manager, when I was there. Whoa. We had Vanessa Fox on uh, uh, on the podcast a few episodes ago. And, and she, she didn't mention us, me? No, she didn't mention <laughs> you. Uh, we're going to have to have her back so we can find out uh, why she regretted to mention that. <laughs> uh, but she, she was telling us about sitemaps and then how it became Webmaster Tools. Um, so when you were working on it, was it still Webmaster Tools? I guess probably. Uh, so the first time, it, like I didn't work on that. I worked on more internal stuff, and she was working on external stuff. And I, I, it because it was hers. I, I don't know what it was called then, uh, <laughs> but it was it's called something very basic. I'm sure. Sitemaps. Yeah, uh, yeah. The branding was just like sitemaps tool, and then sitemaps help center. Yeah, yeah. And then I later on uh, because I I been here so long, you know, I was the first writer on Android before it was even published. Um, I was the first or one of the first writers on cloud. I did a bunch of documentation in a lot of really core uh, infrastructure that uh, is still used today, though I don't know if any of my writing is still there because things get renewed and updated so often. Um, you know, Bigtable, if there's any programmers listening, um, I was the first writer on Bigtable. So I've, I've had a lot of uh, uh, opportunity to work on different areas uh, in Google as a writer. So I guess that means you're providing the documentation for the engineers to make the search algorithms. So ultimately, you're kind of like the boss behind all of the search algorithms. Would you say that's correct? I say that's correct to myself, but <laughs> actually, um, I'm just reporting on the news. I don't have a lot of direct uh, input on sort of search and ranking, that type of stuff. Mostly what I'm doing is documenting how it affects Search Console as a product. Um, I specialize in the Search Console product itself. So the things I document specifically are the help center for Google Search Console. So if you're reading it, that's all my lovely prose. Um, I also work on the email messages that we send out. Um, I, and the uh, user-facing text in the product uh, and tooltips. So anything that deals with sort of like search or ranking or stuff like that, that's kind of out of my domain, um, unless I'm reporting something on how we are reporting search mm. uh, in, the, in the help center. 
So cool. And and since you've been here so long, like surely you've met the founders as well. I have. Uh, when I was in the Seattle office, um, that long ago, uh, Larry and Sergey used to uh, visit uh, the offices much more often, and they came up and visited. And there were about uh, thirty or fifty of us in in the in the lunchroom, and they came in and talked to us. And I had lunch with Larry. I've also bumped into Sergey a few times, just like walking through the halls in, in Mountain View. You know, he would say hi. Uh, and I bumped into uh, Eric Schmidt a couple times, you know, walking through the hallways or in uh, in micro kitchens here. Wow. Okay. Uh, oh, and uh, if <laughs> if if anyone knows who Vint Cerf is, uh, he's like one of the foundational people in the development of the internet. Uh, and he's always wearing a three piece suit, and he's like the nicest guy you'd ever want to meet. And uh, I accidentally stole his desk once. He was visiting the Seattle office, and back then you would reserve a desk. And I came in and I saw a desk because uh, I was, I think, visiting as well. And I just sat down on it. And Vince Cerf walks up and he says, "Oh, I thought I reserved the desk. I guess I was wrong." And he walked away because he's like Aww. such a gentleman. He would. <laughs> never say anything or bump someone away. So he went and found another desk and it was so embarrassed, but he's such a nice guy. <laughs> oh man. So Vint, if you're, if you're listening, I'm coming clean after 15 years that I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> it was his desk. He was correct. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So does, does your input drive any of the changes in search console? Because like surely like you you know the users almost best the real the real product driving comes from uh, our product managers here uh, and helped along by sort of our UXR my input in the, into the product and the usability of it comes from is is a, sort of almost like a stage 0 user when mm -hmm. i'm looking at a new feature or report uh, i'm looking at the mocks done up by the ux designer uh, and I have to step through that uh, and often think in terms of like what, what's really is I know nothing about this and, and and what this is. And so I have to learn about it from from sort of a zero level uh, of background. Um, and I will provide feedback on it based on like, I don't understand this. Like, what does this mean? How does this, uh, how am I supposed to understand this or use this? Uh, and I'll provide that feedback uh, in the early stages to the to the UX designer. And sometimes we come across uh, things where it's either it doesn't make sense, or like we'll see strings or I or, or information that either like I'll suggest like, well, do, do we need this? Does do we need to expose this here? And sometimes the answer is we don't, and sometimes we'll hide it, or the reverse mm -hmm. of like, yeah, I guess we do need to, or. Um, sometimes I'll ask questions that the engineers don't even necessarily know the answer to, and people have to scurry back to like the whole search stack team and ask them, like, what does this really mean? And do we have solid data that we can report here? So that that's my effect on product development here. How do you decide what's like the right level of information to give to people? Because that I, I can relate to that, how you're describing. Like sometimes the engineers want to put so much stuff in there about the background, how they came to this number. And sometimes that can be like too much information or overwhelming. Yeah. 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 Would you include everything in the tooltip, but then the tooltip becomes like somehow not useful if it's got like everything but the kitchen sink in there? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I am perfect in that. I come in as a naive user mm. and, you know, I'm, I'm shooting at is like someone who I, I don't want to generally aim at product experts. Um, if people want to put too much information, I can push back a little bit and say, like, do people understand this or do we need to rename the string? Because like, yeah, it's uh, it's an industry term, but is everybody really going to be familiar with this industry term? Mm. And sometimes I win these battles and sometimes I lose. And if I lose, then I just have to document it a little bit more carefully and explicitly uh, um, in the help center. Sometimes I'll uh, uh, suggest places for additional tooltips. I've also pulled out tooltips that I think are extraneous, like, you know, this is just repeating information that's obvious in there and people don't want to see too many tooltips in there, or or at least you don't want that litter uh, all over the, the the interface. And and if we could pull something out because we because we don't need it, I'll I'll recommend that. Although generally I lean towards 
don't assume that people understand it just because the engineer understands mm -hmm. this. Um, and also sort of the technical expertise. Um, but what's interesting here is that the, the engineers aren't necessarily the, the product experts here. Uh, in fact, a long way from it. You know, the engineers are front-end UI engineers, and they know very well front-end UI engineering. The search stack is an entirely different team, and they have to learn that information by talking to them. So like Google's behavior with HTTPS, uh, they only learn about this through the search team and through the teams that are asking us to build these new reports. Well, often I'll ask the, our engineers questions and they won't know that information and they need to go back and ask the people generating this data. So they're quite often learning this information the same way that I am. The difference often is that the, the, our engineers are just looking to, to create the report and make the report usable. And they're not thinking about the larger aspect of, do we understand this data? Is this data understandable to the users? And, and I'm thinking about it from that perspective. Uh, and so I can provide that feedback and also have to cover that sort of aspect of it in the terminology that we use in, in, in our user text and also in the documentation. So cool. And with, with that much input in, in the documentation side of things, do you have your name in any of these documents? Or is, is this kind of like the curse of being a tech writer at a big company that you're always anonymous? Yeah, it it is the curse. I, I think I had my name on one external doc and everything uh, I've written here, you know, if I were ever to try to prove that I've written external documentation, it would be a hard sell. Mm. Occasionally, I do sneak my name into docs in various ways. I've done it. You know, <laughs> uh, if you, I don't have as much chance here, but like when you have sort of a list of output, you know, I've put uh, messages or my name in the first letter of each of the uh, uh, lines of a query output. I've done that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've put my wife's name in some of the example uh, for podcasts or something like that in, in other products that I document. So occasionally I manage to sneak it in in a sort of a cryptic manner. But yeah, it is it is sort of lonely, an anonymous path to, to stardom. <laughs> but it is a little bit different than working on internal docs, like in terms of publishing something. I, re I remember when I switched from writing internal docs to writing something that's externally visible and it's like search, like people are like tracking every line that we're changing. It feels kind of scary when you put it out there uh, compared to writing for internal engineers. It's like, oh, we can publish it and you know them, like you kind of know who would be reading it and it may be like... 30 people or something uh, compared yeah, to- Yeah, the risk is much lower for internal and, and that was something I did miss. You know, like externally, you have to be uh, uh, conscious of every nuance. You know, people can really, a lot of people are reading it and people can misinterpret mm -hmm. it uh, or think, uh, you know, like Google means this when it doesn't and then news gets out and, and people will get it wrong. And it, you know, it has a lot of risk of making us look bad or people misunderstanding what's going on, whereas internally they can just reach out and get clarification or something like that. And so you could, you don't have to worry about that so much internally. Plus I could put a lot more monkey pictures on my internal docs than I can externally. You know. <laughs> so do you use Search Console for the Search Console Help Center? I, I don't very much. Findability has not been a problem for the Search Console Help Docs in that like, you know, it's pretty easy to see that our documentation is definitive for the product itself. Uh, sometimes what we have a, is a problem of like over visibility in search results in that people sometimes drop into our docs when they're actually looking for something else. You can see that in the user comments. But I mean, I think it's pretty easy for Google's algorithm to realize that when you're looking for search console docs, that the search console help center is going to be relatively authoritative for that. You know, I'll use it occasionally to see like real spikes or or dips in 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 docs, and then try to track down exactly what's going on and like realize oh some external event happened or something like that. But you know, pretty much everybody looking in my docs when I look in Search Console, I see yeah people are looking for Search Console and my docs are coming up, so that's it's pretty it's pretty accurate. <laughs> Do you see? Um confusion happening with like the consumer uh, support.google.com help center that's like using Google search compared to using search console? Do people get confused ever? I don't think so. You know, I think Lizzie, you've done a lot of good SEO there that I 
think the uh, developers.google.com slash search is coming up in the more general, uh, for more general search related topics. I think the confusion is not so much like what the help center versus dev site and whatever random product on the internet or Google thing that people are looking for. So I see feedback in the docs about things like, why why is Netflix not <laughs> showing up in Google search uh, or are the thing like that or um, where's my porn? I get a lot of that. Yeah, I get a lot of that as well. <laughs> <laughs> There's like lots of porn questions. Like, why is Google shutting this down? All these safe search type questions, oh. you know. And I do a lot in my docs to try to make sure to route people to the correct set of docs when they're not getting them. So up at the top, I often have to have in big and black text, like, do you own this web page? Because people are often looking to do things on a web page that they don't own. Mm -hmm. And our, all of our stuff is, a, you could use Search Console for web pages that you do own, and, and people skim over that type of stuff. So the big confusion, actually, that we have in our docs is between Search Console and web search. So people who are just looking for web search type questions will often get somehow into Search Console and ask web search, like again, like the porn questions with safe search or uh, other questions about like- Instagram, like they'll be like, this is my photo on my Instagram page. Like I want it removed from search results, yes. but you're not yes. the owner of Instagram. So right. what page would you go to in order to get that photo removed of yourself? Uh, yes. So even if we put the banner that's like, do you own this page? They're like, yes, this is my Instagram. Like, what do you mean? Uh, and sort of confused about what do we mean by website owner um, is like, I don't know how to make it more clear. Yeah, so ownership of the page uh, and also just stuff that, you know, also unfortunately a lot of people don't realize, again, that like the big question we keep emphasizing is Google isn't going to remove stuff just because you ask it to. And um, people are, are uh, very cranky about that that answer. Um, and, you know, again, Search Console can only help you if you own the page where it's appearing and you are uh, registered on Search Console. And it's a very narrow set of requirements and and, um, and people don't, don't realize that because they, they haven't looked carefully enough at the doc that they're commenting on. I mean, and that's kind of like an interesting issue because it, you have to then put all of these banners on there that's like, are you using the tool in this one specific way? Like you can only use the removals thing if you meet like X, Y, Z criteria. Don't use it for these circumstances. And like everything above the fold is like, are you sure you want to be using this tool? Yeah. And yeah. at the end of the day, is that really a docs issue or is it more of a product thing? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, you know, and people often are in panic mode when this is happening and they're unhappy. And so they're not necessarily reading clearly or something like that. And we have all got that sort of uh, advertising blind spot where like you could put it in a little dialogue box up at the top, you know, these important questions and people will blank them out thinking it's an ad or something like that. Have you come up with other creative ways to tell people like, hey, stop reading, <laughs> or you're in the wrong place. Like, if it's, if a banner is going to be sort of blocked out with ads, like, how else can we sneak attack them? You know, I'll put in, like, a prerequisite sometimes, and then, like, a one, two, three question, like, uh, hopefully that people will read prerequisites, like, uh, are you in this case? If so, go here, like, to another doc. Are you in this case? If so, go here. And, yeah, it's in black bold or sometimes red bold or something like that. And, you know, I also sometimes will put a little thing, a little graphic on the side, but it is a question. I mean, I wish um, we had a, a better mechanism in the feedback to indicate that. Also, sometimes the problem is that it's a problem with the product itself and not the docs. And I like to hear feedback about the, the docs. Um, product feedback, there's a different mechanism. If you're using the product, there is a feedback link right in the product um, that the team uh, should be able to see. And that should really be focused on the product. You know, um, the stuff that I see uh, feedback in the help center um, isn't the best place to really to put feedback about the product itself. So, so it sounds like you're going through all of this feedback, which 
Like it's, uh, sometimes the external perception is, well, there's a feedback link, but nobody ever looks at it anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, but it sounds like both of you are essentially going through all of this feedback and getting all of this grumpy mail and <laughs> trying to improve the, the documents based on that, right? Yeah. I mean, I'm curious, Josh, uh, like how, how often do you look at the queue and uh, do you get it? I mean, I, for me, I have like a filter and I see the emails every day. Um, is that the same for you or do you sort of batch it like look at it only when you are like mentally prepared uh for hate mail <laughs> yeah yeah some of some of the stuff will really like uh, curl your hair that, that you get uh <laughs> you know so if people if people are providing feedback in the docs i, I would recommend um one it's okay to be like point out the problems or the, the negative aspects of it but uh uh, remember that a person is reading that who you know um, doesn't want to s just go home and cry. Uh, and um, two, that it's really focused on exactly what the problem is. And again, if, if three, if it's if it's feedback about the docs, try to make it feedback about the docs. If it's about the product, use the feedback link within the product itself. The feedback, uh, I'll I will go through about once a month through the the docs feedback and try to scan through it. There, there's there's quite a lot of it. So um, I will often look just in terms of like sh generic uh, heuristics of like, is, is it, well, it's all negative, unfortunately. <laughs> and uh, part of that really is uh, just a feature of the feedback mechanism. There's no way to say, I am happy with the product and let me tell you why. It's unfortunately, you only get the additional feedback text link if you say, I am unhappy with, with the docs. But you know, what am I getting for specific pages? Am I seeing a, like a, a large amount of uh, feedback for specific pages? Uh, and then I can I can sort of scan through that type of stuff. Every once in a great while, um, something affecting the product uh, happens that I'll realize is a product with the problem with the product. Uh, if I see people are having problems understanding like uh, tooltips or that the Somehow I can get out of that. The uh, the uh, it's not clear enough that the product UI text is is a little bit misleading, maybe. But again, it's it's generally a scan once once a month. It, it it's more high level stuff. I know in general the docs that people are having problems with, and these are quite often product features, which is verification. Verification is always something that users are having a problem with, and I know that the docs are going to reflect the difficulty of verification. And so I spend a lot of time redoing the steps for verification, realizing I can only make it so simple. But occasionally, you know, I will get feedback that people that I see, oh, obviously by looking at this, it, it's it's confusing. You know, maybe, maybe, maybe um, if, if our viewers, uh, you know, have particularly pertinent feedback for any of the docs, you know, they could put in a hashtag feedback and I can look for things like that. So I know that it's just not uh, some random person ranting um, <laughs> uh, about uh, Google stealing all their information or being an evil company or whatever. Someone is tracking their Android phone or <laughs> their husband is stalking them. It, like you see some really weird stuff in there. <laughs> Um, so just try 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 to keep your your feedback focused. And yeah, you know, I will skim through all of that stuff and and try to get something out of it once a month. Do you have any specific advice for what uh, kinds of feedback would be good? Uh, for example, if they're saying something sort of general, like this is the most confusing piece of documentation that I've ever read in my life, and then they just sort of leave it at that, would that be actionable for you? For me, you know, like if 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 I could say like, what are you trying to do that you're having trouble with? I think that would be the most important thing. Is like I'm having trouble doing X, and then uh, at least gives me some context uh, as like, uh, okay, maybe the docs need to be sharpened up about people who are doing this or that type of thing, um, or if they, you know, you're seeing a mistake or something that's misleading in the doc, you know, that's useful. I also get feedback sometimes from you or Gary. Who are hearing directly from product experts or, or other channels? You know, I'll, I'll get information that way uh, uh, as well about the product. Right, uh, like people will say, like, "Oh, can we have clarification about what do you mean yeah. uh, by this piece of data? Or can we provide more explanation about what this uh, filter actually does, or pulling this type of information up?" Yeah. So, like for example, in the HTTPS report, um, we did a lot of iterations. Um, 
with uh, with product experts or, or smaller groups of people using it, and and they were always confused by this other bucket, which we kept having to rename and um, figure out like. A, is the naming good for it? And B, can we be any more specific on what this really means? As in, like, it just an error. It was an error bucket that was other, that was, it's inherently confusing because it's actually reflecting data itself that is, um, you know, we don't, even though users might think we can always provide ultra specific information about the search stack or 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 what's going on, sometimes we we inside don't even have that level of specificity. There's a lot of information we just don't have. And so we were bucketing this information in a larger group and it can be one of three different possible problems and users were frustrated by this and I totally understand that. So I have to provide labeling either A, can we split this off sometimes to be more specific and B, provide real steps as to like, it's gonna be one of these uh, things uh, which are totally unrelated, but hopefully we think it's one of these things, what it is and what you can do to fix it. And uh, hopefully people will not think that we're just sort of hand waving or trying to be secretive, but that like, you know, really this is like information that uh, we don't know uh, at the product level, like which of these things uh, is going on. Totally. Uh, so definitely being specific in the feedback. Uh, I also have, I've uh, set up filters um, for certain feedback so that I have a filter for high quality. So there's something that is uh, behind the scenes, like looking for what it thinks is high quality. <laughs> um, but I don't think it's very smart uh, because sometimes it will like ignore a short line that's like, uh, typo or something. It's like, okay, the filter thinks that that's low quality, but that's actually uh, a bug that I'd want to see. Um, so mm -hmm. I have a filter set up to catch those kinds of keywords that are like typo or 404 or broken link. Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes the broken one will catch other things that people are like, I'm broken. <laughs> like, why, why are you writing into the feedback this? But like, okay. <laughs> I feel bad, but I don't know why. Uh, yeah, and sometimes we have product suggestions, like um, whenever someone searches for the most beautiful girl in the world, search should return mirrors. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that suggestion. Yeah. <laughs> so kind of taking a step back from the feedback side, what, what was your most favorite documentation project that you've been working on? Uh, in Google or at Search Console? I, I guess in general. Uh, you know, um, it's, at Google, it was kind of exciting to be the first person on the Android team. Uh, and I got to walk around with a test device, um, which I was told not to let anybody see. Oh, and, uh, you know, that's pretty cool. Uh, and yeah, you know, uh, it was really cool. And I was sitting on a, on a bus in, or subway in New York or something. And the guy across the aisle from me, like his head turns like a robot and he looks at me and he looks at the device and he says, what phone is that? <laughs> you know, and I had to put it in my pocket and sort of say, I don't know, I just got it from work and walk away. Uh, so that was pretty exciting. You know, it's funny because it we had no idea that Android would be as big as it would be. You know, it, this was... 2007, eight or something, nobody really knew what phones would eventually become. That was pretty cool. There's something about documenting like a physical item as well, like hardware documentation compared to software documentation where you can actually interact with the device. Um, yeah. I don't know yeah. if that's also what you were doing uh, to sort of know how to use the phone and then write for that kind of thing. Um, but you've got like a physical thing that you can interact with and then test. Yeah, yeah. And it's something that that everybody uses and I would mm -hmm. be using in my daily life, you know, and it's um, so it was, it, it, yeah, it, it really was pretty, pretty, pretty interesting. Cool. So take, taking a step back to even further, I guess. Like, wow, so many steps back. I'm going to fall <laughs> off my chair, I guess. Um, so, since all of this is around search and SEO, do you think about SEO a lot when you're writing these docs? Again, for me, uh, not a lot because, uh, you know, I think we're fairly focused in what we write. I'm not so much worried that somebody else is going to be writing similar material about Search Console. Uh, and if they do and it's good information, I'm actually happy about that. You know, if somebody else can write the same stuff and cover it on their website, you know, we're not depending on ad revenue. <laughs> so, you know, it's it it it's all okay. Second of all, like there's there's a limit to how like, you know, 
we can't add meta tags to our help docs. We can't do a lot of uh, stuff that, you know, if you're running your own website, you can. I'm using a, a general platform for the help center that, you know, I have no access to writing a, uh, a sitemap um, or robots.txt or anything like that. So my tools for SEO are only my wits. You know, it's like <laughs> making sure that, you know, the, the content is as focused as it is. You know, I do think about titles for that and making sure that the titles are really clear, that the page covers what it covers. You know, I I do use zippies and I don't know, I you know, I think, is it true? Like zippies, we used to say, avoid zippies. What's the what's the guidelines for zippies these days? It's okay? Or? I think it's, it's kind of controversial. Uh, yeah. Maybe it's a personal preference. Uh, I am anti-zippy. Yeah. Um, so I think in, in our, uh, the dev site's style guide, I think they have some guidance about like, don't put stuff in there that's like critical information because people are going to skip over it. Mm. Uh, and I think it also depends on the style of the zippy. Like if it's not intuitive that it, you can expand it. Cause we've got feedback about that, um, that the symbol, it was like a plus icon and mm. people didn't know that they could click that to expand it. So even that, and then varying, um, across different regions, like that symbol might not be intuitive, uh, to users in other countries that like this is a zippy or like <laughs> I don't know like then you're hiding this like important information some other country the yeah the dollar sign is used as an expansion I don't know That's like funny. you're right um so I think the like, general guidance is like why would you hide it um if there's important information and then you can't do like command find and like search on the page for that string you have to like expand every zippy so I I I've gotten to like them because, first of all, the, the our docs can be quite long, and the page size width is limited, and which makes it even longer. And then you open up a help page, and it's extremely long, mm. and you've lost people. So my feeling is, the physically shorter I can make a page, um, it can really help people focus on what they need to do. The things I zip up tend to, I will only zip up things that includes procedural material if I can, so that like they're not going to be searching on like that you know the settings button so what they will be searching on hopefully will be the the, the title of the zippy expand mm. so i'll make the expansion title clear uh, and then try not to overwhelm people with so much information on the page. That's why I use the Zippy so that they can really step through and find exactly what they need on the page. Because the ugly thing about being a technical writer is that nobody wants to read anything that I've written. You know, they only read it because they have to. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so like I, you know, people want to see, read and get out. If, uh, if, if, if I could put a button, fix this on the page, that's what they would want. Just fix the problem instead of reading it. Right. Submit URL to Google. Just paste it in the URL. Like, I don't want to have to like interact with the product. I just want to tell you, crawl my URL now and get out of yeah, here. Yeah. And and so, I mean, the, 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 the user's part of the bargain is that they have to spend the time to actually read this stuff. Um, uh, and the more you read the docs, the more you'll get out of it. And I totally understand when I'm like, I get a new washing machine. I don't want to sit down and read the whole user manual. It's really irritating. <laughs> um, but you know, especially when you're talking about very subtle aspects of of search and uh, and what's going on, there is no three step answer. You can't make it happen by following three steps. You have to know what's going on under the hood, understand why this is happening, and the more you understand, the better you can affect your site and and do something. Mm -hmm. And also sometimes the effect is not directly straightforward as to when you're doing something, why why would this happen? And the more you understand, the better it can help you debug your docs and figure out what's going on. So we have to have a background, this long background information and conceptual information. And when I can, I will put quick steps into this is the problem and here's how you fix it. Um, it's just not everything can fit that medium, unfortunately. And also sometimes it's like when you get like with structured data, well, can't you just click the fix this issue? Yeah. And like, yeah, if you control the web page, we this Google is just reflecting what's on the web page. We can't fix your web page. So unfortunately, we can just tell you how you have to go in and fix it. And you have to be able to read it and you know be willing to to take the time to fix it yourself. Hundred percent. Couldn't agree more. 
Um, well, this has been super enlightening. I've learned a lot and I hope uh, everyone else uh, has enjoyed uh, listening to this episode. Um, thank you, Josh, for coming to talk docs with us. I always like having another tech writer uh, on the podcast. Um, if people wanted to find you, could they find you out on the internet? Uh, not so much. There's a lot of Josh Cohens out there. There's a, uh, a soccer player named Josh Cohen. There's a guy who wrote a Broadway play called Josh Cohen. There's uh, unfortunately someone who wrote a Pulitzer Prize winning book, which is not me. Oh. Uh, I, I tend to keep a, a low profile. Uh, I do write under the pseudonym John Updike. Uh, so you may find me in your library. Ooh. I've written a, a couple of books and uh, short stories on there. But uh, other than that, um, you know, uh, just look to me as your uh, tireless, anonymous uh, search console documentation guy. Amazing. All right. And that's it for this episode. Catch you next time. We've been having fun with this podcast, and I hope you, the listener, have found it both entertaining and insightful, too. Feel free to drop us a note on Twitter at Google Search C or chat with us at one of the next events we go to if you have any thoughts. And of course, don't forget to like and subscribe. Thank you and goodbye. Bye. Bye. Bye.